Okay, I think we're good to go. So, should, so we're ready to go, everyone. Okay, uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for for joining us uh, for uh, uh, this uh, Friday's seminar. And uh, in a moment, I'll, I'll introduce our guest speaker. Uh, many of you know that he, he was already uh, did an excellent lunchtime debate with us on upon commodification of nature or not. Uh, which if you didn't catch, I'd recommend catching up on, on our YouTube channel. So we're working him hard for, for this day, but luckily I heard he got a pint of Guinness in between events. So I think, I think uh, he's approaching the challenges style. Uh, uh, so uh, this is a part of a, uh, our Friday Nature Seminar series. And before I introduce uh, uh, Bob, uh, just to uh, mention some of the other events that we have coming up in the uh, uh, next few, few weeks. So next Friday, we have Charlie Burrell from Nep Rewilding talking about uh, re uh, rewilding. Uh, and then we don't have one the following Friday, but then on March, Monday, March the 6th, we have Patrick Greenfield from The Guardian talking about uh, carbon offsets in rainforests and the controversy around that. And he was the leading journalist behind that article in The Guardian that's that stirred lot, lots of uh, noise. Uh, on uh, the 10th of March, we have Michael DePledge from Exeter University on the, the environment and, and health, the search for a healthy environment. And on the 17th of March, we have Sandra Diaz uh, from uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, the the Montreal Montreal uh, uh, the summit, uh, COP biodiversity summit, and uh, the policy biodiversity issues uh, around that. So, so an excellent range of speakers. If you're not an I'm mailing listener, you want to be uh, just uh, email biodiversity at ouc.ox.ac.uk. Uh, or just go to the biodiversity network uh, website. Uh, so today, uh, after this event, uh, there's also a informal drinks reception just down down the corridor on the on the left. And also, Bob has just produced a, a new book on on the topic of today. I, I, I think you've given me your copy. Or you? <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, that book it will be available for sale and for book signing there as well. So if you want your personally autographed uh, a copy of this uh, this book, uh, uh, that, that's your, that's your opportunity uh, to get that. Uh, so uh, uh, it gives me great pleasure to to, invite, to welcome Bob. He's a currently professor of ecological economics at the Institute for Global Prosperity at University College London, and adjunct professor at the College of Business and Economics at the University of Tas Tasmania. He's also senior fellow at the Stockholm Resilience Centre and on, uh, as an honorary professor at Australian National University, and there's a whole range of other institutions there mm -hmm. uh, as well. So. Uh, uh, and uh, he's been he's a founding figure in the whole discipline of ecological economics and he's co-founder and past president of the international society for economic ecological economics and founding editor of the journal ecological economics uh he's also founding editor-in-chief of solutions and editor-chief of the anthropocene uh, review and uh, uh and has had a huge amount of output and influence in shaping the debate around the economics of nature and how how we appropriately uh, value nature and 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 shape uh, a more sustainable pathway for the future. And his new book certainly takes that in, to, to the next level. He said he described this as your your COVID project to yes. work on this as well. So, so this is a one of the one of the outcomes, positive outcomes of the of the challenging last few years that we've had. So thank you for joining us, Bob, and, and over to you. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Arvinder. Can you guys hear me? Okay, yeah. <laughs> is that working <clears throat> yeah okay i think uh it's, it's yeah so there's no system mic here you have to speak loudly i have to speak okay. loudly okay or do i use the mic can you hear me in the back no i, use the mic. Yeah. I think this mic but i think it's mainly for the online recording i don't think that might... or what's this one for yeah that's why i don't think you need this one i think uh unless you can't hear me in the back I think it's lecture theater. I think just to speak loudly is the is the way to do it. And, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and clearly. I'll give it a try, but I've been told that my voice does not carry. So um, we'll see how that goes. <clears throat> if you want me to speak up, just give me a signal in the back and I'll try to speak a little bit louder. So. Um, ah, okay then. Okay. Boy, this Oxford technology is really sort of first rate, you know. <laughs> Got to hand it to you. <laughs> Like, I see that this is still. Yeah. You have some chalk for the black. 
<laughs> this one? This one. Okay. So this one is for the online people. Um, this for the this for this room only. This for online, this room. Yeah. yeah the, this, the online is on your class. That's perfect. Okay. How's that? Nope. Um, yep. Yeah. Can you hear me now? In the back. No. Nope. No. I'm not getting anything. All right. I'll try to shout. Reason this isn't hello, hello. Hello, hello. No. 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 One tube. Okay, there's something to do with this thing. Yeah. No, no. Hello, hello. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello, hello. Oh, well, <clears throat> we will carry on. Never mind. <laughs> we'll go with the old school. We'll keep working on that. <laughs> so, <clears throat> The, the thesis here is that, um, and the question here is, you know, we've known about the problems that we're facing as a society and the crises that we're facing these days. We've known about them for, for decades. Uh, the question is, why have we not solved the problems? And one way of looking at it is that um, we're addicted to the current system. We're locked in um, and changing that system uh, which is, I think, what needs to happen in order for us to, to solve these problems, to create a sustainable well-being future, uh, is going to take a bit more or a different, a different approach than simply pointing out the problems. Uh, it's going to take um, a, some sort of therapy. Let's see. <laughs> so where are we? We know that we're no longer in an empty world. We're in the Anthropocene epoch. And I'm sure you've all heard that term before. Um, <clears throat> And, and it means that you know the influence of humans on the planet and the life support system uh, is is so large uh, that that we have to take that interaction much more forcefully, much more directly into account. We can't ignore the the relationships with the rest of nature, with the rest of the the world. I think it also means that business as usual is no longer an option. Uh, a lot of our policies and ideas and visions about how the world works and the kind of world we want to create. We're created in this empty world context, um, you know, assuming that we had an infinite supply of, of natural resources, essentially. Um, <clears throat> well, we don't, um, we don't. We live on a finite planet. And in order to create this sustainable and desirable Anthropocene, which I think we're, we should be trying to do, we need to think and act differently. And it, in a sense, it's an opportunity because it opens the door for us to build a different kind of economy and society that's based more on the goal of sustainable well-being and the well-being of humans and the rest of nature. And so it's going to take some changes in how we look at the relationship between uh, people and the rest of nature. And I say it that way explicitly, um, <clears throat> that we're all in this interconnected, complex system. Uh, and we have to take that more explicitly into account. So to create sustainable well-being, I think we need to integrate these three elements of, first of all, having an adequate vision of the way the world works, you know, our scientific understanding of this complex interdependent system of humans and the rest of nature. And I think we're making a lot of progress on that, you know, in earth system science, understanding how the climate works, but also understanding uh, human psychology. There's a whole field of positive psychology that looks at you know, what actually does contribute uh, to people's sense of, of well-being. Uh, so, but I think the challenge there is how do we integrate all of those different pieces uh, of our understanding? How do we look at the whole system? Uh, that's partly what ecological economics is trying to do, but I think there's lots of other um, uh, initiatives that are, that are also headed toward building that more integrated understanding. But we also need a, an adequate vision of how we would like the world to be. 
what are our goals uh, for the future? What are we trying to create? And I think that's an important element in the, uh, in the therapy as I'll talk about. Um, combined with that and integrated with that, I think we need <clears throat> um, the appropriate set of tools and analytical techniques. And that's gonna require more, I think, systems thinking and, and, uh, and modeling and looking at how, these, how the pieces of this, of this complex world are interconnected and how we can use that information to, to help us create a better, a better system. And finally, I think to implement those ideas, we're gonna take, we're gonna need some new kinds of institutions. Uh, and I think we're gonna need some, some therapy uh, to, to overcome uh, this, this addiction to, to growth. Um, <clears throat> I like to show this one because it's just really cool. Uh, <laughs> and just to indicate, you know, how much we do understand about how this planet functions. You know, this is net primary production over, over a yearly cycle. Uh, but just to think of the world as a living system, uh, you know, and we're able to, uh, by accumulating uh, all of this data and re representing it and modeling it, uh, you know, we can begin to understand some of the complexities in how, in how the world functions. Uh, so <clears throat> we also know that the world is a complex, nonlinear, adaptive system. There are thresholds, there are tipping points, you know, there, there are surprises. Uh, this is from a recent paper by Tim Lenton and others looking at some of the potential tipping points in the climate system. You've probably seen some version of this, um, <clears throat> you know, that include things that have to do with uh, melting of the ice sheets, you know, uh, changing of ocean circulation, uh, loss of biomes, any one of these could, could cause a really rapid uh, shift in the climate system. <clears throat> so uh, to take that into account, uh, there's been some work on this idea of planetary boundaries. You've probably seen some version of this idea floating around as well, I'm sure. Uh, this is a, a, a more recent one. <clears throat> oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention at the beginning uh, that I wanted to dedicate this talk uh, to, uh, to my colleague and friend, uh, Will Steffen, uh, who recently and unexpectedly passed away, uh, and also to my colleague and friend, Herman Daly, and, uh, who also passed away recently. And both of them have been very influential on uh, all of this uh, work that I'm, I'll be presenting. Um, anyway, the planetary boundaries idea, uh, you know, that, that there are fundamental ecological constraints. Uh, the, probably the most well-known is, cli uh, is climate, but there's also, you know, biodiversity loss and biogeochemical flows and ocean acidification, et cetera. So are we getting close to tipping points in, in any of these uh, planetary boundaries? And how do, we, how do we stay within those constraints? This diagram from one of uh, Will Steffen's recent papers shows this quite clearly, you know, that in the, in the past, <clears throat> in the Holocene uh, epoch, uh, we were going through glacial and interglacial cycles, uh, you know, on the, on the earth. Um, and it wasn't until the Holocene that we really stabilized at a relatively um, uh, warm, relatively stable temperature. Uh, but now we're approaching, can I use this? Uh, yeah, it's a pointer, or do I have to use this thing? <laughs> anyway, uh, we're approaching a potential, you know, uh, bifurcation, and we could go over a very severe planetary threshold into this hot house Earth if one of these tipping points are are are, are actually passed. Um, and there's there's really uh, no way back from that. So, <clears throat> in the same sense, you know that uh, that substance abuse addicts can see the long-term consequences of their, their actions. Uh, we can see where, where things are headed uh, for the planet, both in terms of climate, but in terms of many other potential, potential crises. Um, but how do, we, how do we get off of, the, uh, of that roller coaster? We know these inconvenient truths, uh, but that's not the movie that a lot of people are, are still lining up to go see. It's easier to keep doing what we're doing um, not worry too much about um, about what happens in the ever ever increasing uh, increasingly close future. Uh, so how do we how do we overcome that? Well, I think what we need is a third movie. Um, we need a new vision, a new narrative. We need to to uh, to show what a sustainable and desirable economy in society in the rest of nature can look like, and why that's a better world. Uh, for everyone involved, uh, including the rest of nature, but but including us. And I think that's going to require changing our, our vision a bit about what the economy is, how it interacts with uh, society and the rest of nature, recognizing the embeddedness of the economy in society and the rest of nature. These are not separate things. 
And I think this is a core uh, change in vision of the ecological economics and other, other initiatives like that to recognize that whole systems uh, perspective. So, and we heard from um, Kate, Kate Rayworth was the, the, uh, the moderator of our debate earlier and her, uh, her famous safe and just donut. You know, so we need to stay within those planetary boundaries, but we also need to create the elements of well-being and quality of life uh, you know, to, to support uh, a just and safe um, uh, future. So that's the kind of world that we're trying to create. How do we get that vision <clears throat> across to a much larger uh, community? Um, <clears throat> as I said, ecological economics is similar in that regard. Uh, it has three integrated questions or goals that, first of all, we need to stay within planetary boundaries. We need an ecologically sustainable scale. We need a fair distribution of wealth and resources, both within the current generation of humans, but also between current and future generations and between humans and other species. And this whole issue of of uh, social capital, fair distribution. I think these are these are key elements that support uh, sustainable well-being. And finally, we need an economically efficient allocation of resources. And the market only goes so far. Uh, there are many resources that are not part of the market and shouldn't be, and they need to be included in our in our allocation uh, systems. Uh, but those are going to have to include different kinds of institutions that can deal with common property resources more more effectively. So, and there, this is not the only uh, terminology, I think, that's been used for some of these same, same ideas. Uh, the well-being economy, the circular bioeconomy, the regenerative economy, uh, even ecological civilization, the donut economy, steady state economy. So there's several different terms, I think, that have been used, but I think they all overlap quite, uh, quite a bit in terms of the, their basic ideas. But let's step back a little bit and look at what is the empty world vision? What is the vision that's still driving a lot of the policy uh, decisions that we're seeing in, in many countries still? And it looks something like this in cartoon form, you know, that you have land, labor, and capital, these primary factors of production that are producing marketed goods and services, rival and excludable goods and services measured by GDP. Uh, which are then either consumed or reinvested to make more capital so you can produce and consume more things in the next time period. Uh, land is kind of grayed out here to, to, uh, to, to represent the fact that it's sort of, um, there's a, an assumption of almost perfect substitutability between land and other capitals. Uh, so you don't really need land or natural resources, you just need more capital and labor. Um, best of its private property, uh, because that's what uh, these sorts of goods and services are most amenable to, and <clears throat> that consumption is the, the main source of our utility and welfare. So the basic premises are, you know, more is always better, all else, all else being equal. You know, GDP is a good proxy for, for well-being or welfare. This economy can grow forever. There's not scale and planetary boundaries are not an issue. You don't see any, any limits on this system. Um, Poverty can best be solved with more growth. <clears throat> you know, let's just make the bit the pie bigger, and then you know that will can distribute that uh, later. A rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, when in fact, that rising tide in the past has only lifted the lot, the yachts, and only the really big yachts, uh, as a matter of fact. And that nature's a sideshow, and private property is always best. So, what's wrong with that model in the Anthropocene? Uh, in the Anthropocene, we know that we live in a finite materially closed earth system. And we only have one of those, um, that these four basic types of assets or capital are all required in a more balanced way uh, to produce both conventional goods and services measured by GDP, but also to produce well-being more broadly conceived. Um, so, and that they also produce waste products with that, which have disamenity effects. And that well-being is a much more complex function than simply the more we consume, the better off we are. So, um, and that idea of quality of life or well-being, I think there's been a lot of research on that as well, as I said, in, in the field of positive psychology and measuring uh, subjective well-being. Uh, there are lots of surveys these days. Um, in, there's the, the World Happiness Report, which comes out every year that measures people's answer to the question, you know, all things considered, how satisfied are you with your life? Uh, that's going to depend on a bunch of different things and not just uh, how much we're consuming, but this is the sort of basic human needs list that 
originally from Maslow, but more recently from uh, Manfred Max Neef and, and Amartya Sen and Barbara Nussbaum. But you know, there are different lists like this, but it's a much more complicated set of human needs. And I think if you think about it, these are all things that contribute to your personal sense of, of well-being and subjective well-being. How much weight you give to them depends on your culture, your personality, and, and a range of other things. But what we can do from a policy perspective then is to create the opportunities for people to meet those needs, you know, by how we arrange our, our assets, our built, our human, our social, and our natural capital, and how we use our time. So <clears throat> I think that's ultimately what we're we're after. How do we create a world that's focused on well-being? And what does that mean? <clears throat> how do we how do we think about it? How do we measure it? How do we bring together all of the different lines of thinking uh, that have gone into to, to how we describe that? Uh, and, and there are, you know, several syn near synonyms, I think, for, for what this means, um, the idea of flourishing or prosperity or quality of life, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> one of those contributors to well-being is this idea of ecosystem services, uh, you know, the, the benefits that we derive from, uh, from our natural capital assets, from, from the rest of nature. Uh, and this is from the Millennium Assessment. You, I think I showed this in the earlier talk as well. Um, that breaks it into these four categories of provisioning, regulating, cultural, and supporting services, and how they all contribute to the different aspects uh, and, and components of, of human well-being. What's missing from this diagram, I think, is the interaction with the other three forms of capital. So we really have to understand how all four of these types of assets, and they are uh, quite different in their characteristics. You know, our social capital involves you know, all of our networks, formal and informal, our cultures, our, our governments, you know, everything that's uh, built up of more than more than individual people, uh, the human capital and our and our built infrastructure. Uh, so how do these how do these elements all interact uh, over time uh, to create sustainable uh, human well-being? There's been a lot of uh, growing interest in this idea of ecosystem services with the IP best. Um, <clears throat> uh, recently formed and is producing uh, regular assessments. This is sort of the, the uh, IPCC equivalent uh, that, that deals with ecosystem services. I'm sure most of you in this room have probably heard of that, heard of IPBES, yeah, or been involved with it uh, for that matter. The Ecosystem Services Partnership is another global group of, of practitioners and, uh, and researchers working on this idea of ecosystem services. Um, there's been a, you know, exponential growth in academic interest in this topic. Uh, this is just the number of research papers published um, over time. And, and we're now up to, what, more than 6,000 articles per year published on the topic and 40, over 40,000 altogether. The most highly cited of those is this one we published back in 1997, which was an initial attempt uh, to try to quantify how, how big are these ecosystem services relative to uh, GDP in this case, or, or in monetary units. And we found that, you know, they're, they're much larger uh, than everything that the, that the market measures itself. And yet they're not marketed uh, services. These things are outside the market. They're community property, common, common property assets. Um, <clears throat> one thing we didn't get to do was put, uh, <laughs> design the cover. We got, we got the article on the cover, but, but they said pricing the planet when we met more like valuing the planet because these are not these are not exchange values that we're talking about, but but different ways of trying to incorporate the value of ecosystem services. Since then, we tried to estimate using the same sort of techniques. Um, how have things changed since 1997? In this case, to, to 2011, and we found that because of land use change, largely because of desertification, loss of wetlands, loss of coral reefs, etc., we're losing about 20 trillion dollars a year. Uh, worth of ecosystem services uh, because of that. Does this have to continue? <clears throat> um, these are four different uh, scenarios going forward. And you can see from this that uh, if we continue along the, the same lines, our, con our conventional market forces scenario, uh, that's going to lead to additional losses of ecosystem services. We can arrest that and sort of stabilize it with, with enough uh, government intervention and policy reform. Or we can have a great transition uh, where we really um, make the effort to rebuild and restore uh, ecosystems and the services they provide, and begin to to recover uh, some of that uh, some of that those services and values. 
I put this up because this is not just a quantitative uh, exercise. Uh, this is from Pope Francis's encyclical, uh, where he makes the point that, you know, if businesses profit by calculating and paying only a fraction of the cost, uh, this the and leaving out the social cost, uh, that's that's going to be unethical. Uh, that that you can't do that. You can't let other people or future generations bear those costs. Uh, so it makes sense <clears throat> uh, to try to quantify, to the extent that we can, uh, what those costs are and how to how to how to uh, <clears throat> charge them to the appropriate parties. Any questions so far? Can you still hear me in the back? Okay, good. <laughs> so that was the natural capital part. There's social capital is equally, if not more important, in terms of supporting human well being. This is from a book by Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson that came out a couple of years ago, this, the spirit level, where they looked at the relationship between income inequality by OECD country and this whole range of social problems. And there's a very strong relationship. The, the, the more inequality there is in a country, um, the more social problems they have, the lower their social capital is. Uh, it contributes to lower overall uh, well being in the country. So, <clears throat> being able to um, uh, worrying about distribution and fair distribution is really important to establishing and maintaining quality of life. <clears throat> and yet, we're still measuring uh, GDP as our main, main indicator. We know, for example, that if you plot GDP per capita versus life satisfaction from these surveys, you get curves that look something like this. This is kind of an old one, but I don't think the, the general shape has changed. Um, there's a a rapid increase at first, uh, but beyond a certain level, there's not much of a relationship between GDP per capita and, and life satisfaction because of these other factors that influence well-being, uh, because of wealth and, and income distribution, because of uh, damages to, to natural capital and social capital in general. So, <clears throat> and the reason is GDP was never designed as a measure of societal well-being. Uh, it only measures uh, market activity. How much mark, how much things are sold, bought and sold in markets per per year, um, and one of the uh, original uh, architects of GDP, Simon Kuznets, uh, warned against using GDP as a welfare measure. Uh, you know, if you're going to talk about growth, you got to talk about growth of what and for what. So, what are we what are we trying to grow? <clears throat> GDP measures um, uh, market activity, and all of that activity is counted as a positive. You know, so if there's more crime, if there's more environmental pollution, um, et cetera, uh, those add to GDP. You have to have more police, you have to have more security devices, et cetera. Uh, <clears throat> so it was never designed for that purpose. Uh, and, and, and yet that's what we're using as our major, uh, our major policy goal. Um, this was sort of agreed to at the Brenton Woods Conference in 1944, right after, uh, toward the end of World War II, where the allies all came together and created the IMF and the World Bank <clears throat> and, uh, and GDP had just recently been, been created by Simon Kuznets and others. So it doesn't go back all that far. You know, this is something that's just a product of the depression and, and, and World War II. It's not magic in any sense, uh, but they, <clears throat> they kind of decided as a group at this conference that that's, that's something that all countries should be measuring uh, just as a way to, 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 uh, to calculate economic progress. Um, I think it's only later that it became such a, a dominant goal. And now we get these ideas that, you know, what we really need to do, we need to keep growth going. And to do that, we need to increase consumption, even if that consumption is not of things that we really want or need. So <clears throat> I think it's well beyond time to, you know, leave GDP behind as our as our major policy goal. Not that we shouldn't be measuring it, uh, but we need we need a better alternative. And there have been many alternatives proposed. In fact, we're doing a class right now at, at UCL. We're trying to document all of the alternatives that have been proposed and we're up above 200 so far. So this is just a small subset of those. But they, they fall into these three basic categories, I think. Uh, things, uh, indicators that try to modify GDP. And I'll talk about the genuine progress indicator a little bit. Um, <clears throat> indices that, that uh, uh, well, uh, surveys that look at life satisfaction, basically in some in some form, 
uh, through surveys and and indexes or composites that take a bunch of factors and and uh, put them together and rank them. Um, <clears throat> I won't go into detail on on any of them except this one, the genuine progress indicator, uh, just to show you some interesting results from that. Um, it starts with personal consumption, which is a major component of GDP, but then it weights it by income distribution. Uh, so it's getting at the difference between income and welfare. Um, it then adds a few things that are left out of GDP, like the value of household labor and volunteer work. You know, these are positive things. They're not marketed, so they're, they're not counted. And then it subtracts a bunch of things that are really, should really be thought of as costs. You know, the, law, the, the cost of commuting, the cost of crime, uh, the cost of a range of natural capital components, air and water pollution, et cetera. Um, this indicator has been done for many countries around the world. We, we came up with a global index uh, and compared that with GDP per capita. And you get results that look like this. Uh, so from 1950 or so till about 1980, we were in a period of what Herman Daly has called economic growth, true economic growth, because GDP and GPI, genuine progress, were both increasing. But since then, you know, even though GDP has continued to climb um, on a per capita basis, GPI has declined uh, slightly. Why? Because of increasing inequality, increasing environmental damage, um, et cetera. So you could think of this as the, the sort of strength of the addiction currently. Why are we still pursuing GDP when, in fact, our genuine progress is actually, uh, is actually stable or declining? So what do we have to do to create this sustainable well-being economy and society? And I'm thinking that uh, we need to break this addiction to the growth at all costs paradigm uh, and um, to fossil fuels uh, in particular and to overconsumption, particularly in high income countries. Uh, and in order to do that, a key step is building a shared vision of a more sustainable and desirable future. Uh, one that focuses on well the well-being of humans and and the rest of nature. Why is that a key step in the therapy? Well, we looked at uh, uh, what are the analogies between what works at the individual level to overcome addictions and what might work at the at the societal scale. And one therapy that seems to work quite well at the individual scale is something called motivational interviewing. Has anybody heard of this before? Any psychologists? One. <laughs> So motivational interviewing doesn't confront addicts with their problem, you know, and say, you got to stop doing this, which is what we're doing at the societal scale, pretty much. And we find that that can be quite, not only not effective, but even counterproductive in terms of, you know, inducing some sort of denial reaction, as we see. <clears throat> but what it does instead is base is uh, engage addicts in a positive discussion uh, of their goals or motives, their, their, uh, their vision for the future. What do you want to do with your life? and establish that first, and then use that to help motivate the kinds of difficult changes that are gonna be required in order to get there. The same process, I think, works quite well in, business, uh, in businesses sometimes. You know, actually establishing shared goals for a business can really help to motivate the changes that, that uh, need to happen to get there. So <clears throat> it's not that unusual of, of a process, but the question is how do we employ that really at the societal scale? There have been a couple of interesting examples. And in the book, I talk a little bit about uh, the example about the, the Swedish labor market, uh, where they, you know, in the, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, they, they were having uh, strikes and, and, uh, and labor disputes and the sort of whole cycle went, uh, went over and over. And they finally came together and decided on establish some shared goals and said, no, this is really not working for us. What we really want is a much more stable system, you know, where we can negotiate things as we go along. And they stay up, establish these labor accords, which have been in effect uh, since then and have made the Swedish labor market quite, uh, quite an effective uh, system. And there are some other uh, historical examples, but they have to do with how do you, how do you establish those shared goals, you know, even, even after there's been a period of conflict going forward? Well, we have been doing that. There has been some progress on that on that front, I think. And the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which I'm sure you all have heard of by now. Is that true? Is there anybody here who hasn't ever heard of the Sustainable Development Goals? In this room, I'd be very surprised. But think about how many people in the world have ever heard of the Sustainable Development Goals. You know, is it 
2%, 10%? I don't think it would be a very high percentage, although I'd like to do that and see the results of that, that kind of survey. So people don't realize, uh, like, like we do in the academic and the policy community, that there are a set of established and agreed global goals <clears throat> that include much more than, than simply economic growth. Uh, that you know that have no poverty, no hunger, you know, quality education, all of the things that we've been talking about that contribute uh, to well-being, uh, including urgent action on climate, you know, um, managing ecosystem services, peace and justice, etc. Uh, so <clears throat> there is some progress uh, that that we can build on. I think um, we need we need to recognize that those goals are not 17 independent goals; that they're all interconnected. They all have their synergies and trade-offs among them. They contribute to the sub-goals that I mentioned of sustainable scale, fair distribution and efficient allocation in different ways. And that these contribute to this overarching goal of a, of a well-being, sustainable well-being future uh, in different ways as well that are gonna vary, you know, depending on the context and the situation uh, in countries. But understanding those complex relationships, I think is something we need to work on. Um, and we need to, to, to expand that discussion, I think, uh, much more broadly. Um, in this recent book, we asked a, uh, a, a group of thought leaders uh, to tell us what they thought uh, a sustainable and desirable future would look like. Uh, can you describe that future in a way that is engaging and compelling enough you know, for people to, uh, to understand and get on board with? There's been a lot of work in this, this area of uh, scenario planning <clears throat> as well. You know, what are the possible futures going forward, the plausible futures? And of these, which ones do we really want to achieve? Uh, so thinking about, and this is from the um, Great Transition Initiative scenarios. Um, they have the sort of typical market forces scenario, a policy reform scenario, a great transition scenario, and a sort of collapse fortress world scenario. Um, <clears throat> and I think the SDGs, you know, very much fit into that great transition uh, scenario space. Uh, where we focus much more on community and well-being rather than simply uh, GDP growth and at the uh, individual or community scale. But the challenge is, how do you communicate those futures to a broad audience and engage them in a discussion of the kind of world that that we want? How do we build the shared vision of this world? You know, is it is it enough to show pictures of what that world would look like? Uh, could we do something a little more uh, engaging, you know, some short videos or, or graphics? Uh, so <clears throat> I'm not sure if there are any uh, people from the film community here, uh, but, you know, how do, how do we begin to build um, descriptions of a positive future that can, uh, that can begin to engage people? Because I think the characteristics of this positive future are ones that are fairly broadly shared. Uh, they're just not recognized for that. We tried in Australia to do a public opinion survey. <clears throat> We've got 2,000 representative individuals uh, to read about these four alternative futures for Australia. We changed the, the terminology a bit um, just to avoid sounding too value laden, uh, but <clears throat> um, they're basically the same scenarios as the great transition ones, uh, community well being instead of the great transition, for example. Um, and the results we got there when we asked people to rank those scenarios were that, you know, the vast majority uh, liked or ranked the well-being, uh, the community well-being scenario, uh, either first or second in their in their rankings. Not everyone. And this was a, a sort of one-off survey online. So people didn't have an opportunity to talk with each other about what kind of future they wanted. Um, <clears throat> they were just taking a, an online survey. So I think it needs to go a bit further than that. And we're working on trying to do, you know, more elaborate kinds of engagements uh, with people to say what kind of future that they want. So I think that's a, a big part of the therapy, <clears throat> um, how to build that, that shared vision and that, that can help motivate the kind of changes that we need. Uh, and those changes are gonna include, I think some changes to uh, property rights and how we manage uh, uh, common assets. And so we've been working on this idea of common asset trusts as a, as a way, as an institutional mechanism for managing and stewarding these kinds of resources. This is based on the work of Eleanor Ostrom, <clears throat> uh, who studied uh, and, and got first woman to get the Nobel Prize in economics for her work on how to manage the commons and how, how people have effectively managed the commons in various situations around the world and what kind of design principles flow from that, that study. So she came up with a list of clearly defined, of, of clear design principles that are needed 
uh, when you're building these kinds of institutions. You have to have clearly defined boundaries. Uh, otherwise, it's an open access resource. It's going to be exploited uh, or overexploited. Uh, but those, those property boundaries don't have to be private property boundaries. They can be community property boundaries. And that community has to participate in creating, defining the rules uh, and to govern the, the system and enforcing those rules. And it has to be in a polycentric uh, sort of format where it can be, uh, in, it can be um, <clears throat> uh, engaged with uh, other levels of governance uh, that, are, that are involved. So, uh, for example, uh, we've, we've recommended or, or proposed that what we could do is think of the atmosphere as a common property resource. Uh, how do we think of, and, and that um, once you've established that, and the public trust doctrine is one legal instrument that sort of supports that, that, uh, that claim, that, that governments are responsible by the public trust doctrine to, to um, uh, preserve, maintain all the, uh, the, the commons essentially for, for their, their, uh, uh, their constituents. Um, so what if we created a trust um, for the atmosphere and required those parties that damaged that property uh, to pay for the damages? And those, those damages could then be redistributed uh, to, uh, to recover the, the asset uh, and to pay those who, who were affected by those damages. So that's one application. Ultimately, I think it's going to take a movement uh, to make any of this happen. Uh, I don't think it's going to come from strictly from the policy community or the academic community. Uh, but it's going to kind of it's going to have to come from society more generally. Uh, this group called the Wellbeing Economy Alliance is trying to pull together all of the different actors uh, that are in, that are involved in this sort of uh, this sort of idea. Uh, one of those groups was the Wellbeing Economy Governments Initiative, established by Nicholas Sturgeon, who I've, I'm told has recently decided to step down from her position. Uh, but <clears throat> there's a really good TED talk uh, you can take a look at uh, where she talks about the well-being economy and why why it's absolutely necessary that we move in that direction. And there's a a group of vanguard governments uh, that are that have been moving in that direction. So it's uh, there's some things happening. Certainly, New Zealand was one of the first, you know, to create a, a well-being uh, budget and to think about the need for societal well-being as being the the main policy goal. Uh, Iceland has also moved in that direction, along with Finland. Uh, <clears throat> and if you want to learn more about uh, we all and join the, join this movement, take a look at their uh, at their website, uh, the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. Uh, there's also the, <clears throat> um, the Club of Rome, of, of which I'm a member, uh, that's produced this this uh, document recently, uh, their Earth for All Survival Guide for Humanity, which is a, a sort of update of the, the limits to growth. If you remember from 50 years ago, ago um, <clears throat> this has a new, a new model of the, the global system, a systems dynamics model, and a couple of scenarios that look at how we can get from where we are now to the kind of uh, positive future that, that, uh, that I've been talking about. Um, and finally, um, one question that always comes up here is, well, is any of this feasible? You know, can you have an economy that actually doesn't grow and is still viable, that is still creating you know, prosperity and well-being? Uh, is it essential that, that economies grow? And these three books all look at that question. <clears throat> um, Managing Without Growth by Peter Victor, Prosperity Without Growth by Tim Jackson, and Cancel the Apocalypse by Andrew Sims. Um, <clears throat> Andrew uh, looked around the world and said, well, uh, if you look at, around the world, you can, always, you can find places where all of these policies are already in place, are already already uh, happening. They're just not all happening in the same place. Uh, so it's kind of a feasibility test. You know, it's not that this is pie in the sky, these things could never work. They are working <clears throat> um, and there are good case studies for them. Uh, what Peter Victor did was create a, a computer model of the Canadian economy uh, and asked that model, uh, you know, what happens if you shut off growth? And if you just shut off growth and don't do anything else, you can get a disaster. But if you design the system properly and implement the right set of policies, you can get a stable, steady state economy uh, where, where that is not growing, uh, but is still prosperous and has a high quality of life. And I'll end with this <clears throat> set of 12 things we need to change, a 12-step program to get from, from here to there. 
And these are the policies that Peter had to incorporate into his computer model in order to stabilize it. First of all, you need new meanings and measures of success. So you have to get beyond GDP to something that's measuring what you really want to measure, uh, the well-being of the, of the society. <clears throat> you need limits on materials, energy, waste, and land use. You've got to stay within planetary boundaries, basically. You need more meaningful prices. You know, so the market's, the market's not telling us the truth about any of the prices that we're paying because it's leaving out all of the external costs uh, to our natural and social cost capital. You need more durable, repairable products. You know, we don't need to create things that are with uh, planned obsolescence. Um, <clears throat> fewer status goods and, and more community goods. So we, sh <clears throat> we shouldn't be buying, buying things, uh, you know, simply uh, for status. You know, you don't need a bigger car simply because your neighbor has one or a bigger house. Uh, so <clears throat> get, uh, go back on that. More informative advertising. Advertising should be telling us what the product does, not trying to convince us that we're not happy and we only can be happy if we you know, buy their product and, and change, trying to change uh, preferences. Better screening of technology. Technology is a good servant, but a poor master. Uh, so we should, try, we should invest in the technology that's gonna help us achieve our goals, not just, just anything. More efficient capital stock, uh, like the, the more efficient um, uh, consumer goods. Uh, more local, less go global. This is an interesting one. So the idea here is <clears throat> um, local economies produce more welfare than, than the global economy because you're building social capital at the local scale. Uh, you don't, doesn't, doesn't mean you can't trade things or you shouldn't have a, a, a global economy, uh, but we should focus more on, um, on what happens at the global scale and how that contributes to well-being, not, not just how it contributes to, uh, to prices. Reduced inequality, we talked a lot about that. <clears throat> Absolutely essential to build social capital going forward. Less work, more leisure. Anybody opposed to this one? <laughs> you don't, this, this one will probably fly <laughs> almost anywhere. And finally, uh, education for life and not just work. Uh, so we need to recognize that, that what we're doing here is not just training people to get a job to buy stuff that they probably don't really need. You know, we're training people to understand what contributes to their well-being, what contributes to community well-being, how to make the world a better place, essentially. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you both. Uh, fantastic oversight. A uh, really amazing range. Yeah. Uh, so we can open up to questions now. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Um, you mentioned um, the importance of local, um, to some extent, over the global, uh, or at least focusing on the local rather than just the global but the kind of initiatives that one of at least some of the initiatives that you presented were you know leaders of nations coming together to suggest do you think that this is something that will be um ideally brought about uh from the top down or from the bottom up well i think like most of these things it's got to be from both directions <clears throat> um and uh, it's, it's not that we should, um, well, globalization, you know, I think should be, should be part of the picture, uh, but we shouldn't pursue globalization simply to reduce prices and to maximize GDP. Uh, that's the point. Uh, so trade and interactions that improve well-being and having, you know, sort of global governance systems are certainly, uh, can, can help in that direction, uh, are things that, that need to be supported. But if it's only to produce products more cheaply, you know, to maximize GDP, then we, then we're going to do be better with local economies because they, because they produce other byproducts that do contribute to, to local well-being. But in terms of bringing about positive change, which do you think will come first? Um, that's a good question. And I think this sort of change, I think, is going to come as some sort of tipping point. You know, where we there's a lot of people, like I said, in the, the well-being economy uh, alliance that are all talking about these same sorts of things. And I think there's a growing, you know, awareness in the population that things are not going well. 
I think we're at the stage now where we're beginning to recognize that, yes, we have a problem, we have an addiction. <laughs> so the next step is, you know, how do we then begin to build this therapy? And I think that uh, that's going to cause, you know, changes that happen quite quickly, but unexpectedly. And so as a tipping point sort of phenomena. So it's hard to predict, you know, what's going to be the thing that pushes it over the edge. Uh, but I think we can sort of feel the, the, uh, the things building up, like the collapse of the Soviet Union, for example. I mean, nobody foresaw that really from the outside, at least. But on the inside, things were happening. And eventually, you know, it, uh, it was enough to push it over the edge. So thanks for that question. <laughs> What do you think should happen to conventional economics? Should we throw it out and start again? Or is there a journey from conventional to ecological economics as an well, academic? Well, they say paradigms practical. change one funeral at a time. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and I think that's part of the problem with addiction because I think uh, we, get, we get locked in to our sort of academic, uh, you know, homes. And I think... Um, many economists have spent so much time and effort, you know, invested in that particular way of looking at things and that particular model that it's going to be difficult uh, to change. You know, they can have, some of them can have epiphanies and that would be great, um, <clears throat> but it's, uh, it, it is hard. And I think maybe it, the same sort of therapy might apply. You know, how do you, how do you show them a better way? How do you show them a world where they can contribute something positive, uh, but but not in the same, not using the same sort of models and background as, as they have been. And uh, <clears throat> one way we thought about doing that is well, if you if you get diverse groups together in these sort of synthesis workshops and say we have a problem to solve together, you bring the economists in, you bring every you know the other stakeholders in, they can play a role in in a, a creative role in trying to find real solutions. Uh, and then they're not so locked into you know their their paradigm. They're, say, they're just there as individuals that, who can contribute based on, on what they know or what they can come up with. So that would be one way, but it's going to have to get, get beyond the normal sort of academic approach uh, to teaching, teaching economics classes in the old, the old paradigm. Um, yes. Yeah, thank you. That was a, a great lecture. I guess my question is related to, to what was just said. Um, so we have you know, little time to transition towards this, um, to embark on a transition towards this more sustainable future. Uh, the, the year often mentioned is 2030, which is just right around the corner. And um, so I, I personally certainly endorse the 12 steps and I understand the mechanism you've just mentioned uh, to get stakeholders together. But we know we have very powerful actors who um, uh, certainly don't want to see the system change, right. uh, at least not in the way those 12 steps outline, because what they call for is more government intervention, uh, less uh, emphasis on markets. Um, so if we don't grow the economy, we need to redistribute wealth. Um, and so I, I just wanted to hear a bit more about um, about your vision for for how we can achieve that um, beyond what you've you've already outlined. Is there anything else that comes to mind? Well, it seems like the fossil fuel sector is really getting in the way of progress at the moment and have been for the last <laughs> for the last several decades. You know, and there's a lot of um, <clears throat> new evidence coming to light uh, about the fact that they, you know, they knew about climate change, you know, from from the beginning and has ha have had better data probably than than the academic community. And so it's very similar to the you know tobacco industry and their stance on on uh, on tobacco. So <clears throat> I think we could come down on the, on the fossil fuel sector much more uh, than we have been you know and start <clears throat> could sue them for damages we could we could build a you know a uh, civil society movement uh you know to to sort of uh, uh, <clears throat> uh disinvest in the fossil fuel uh, sector in various ways um public unrest you know toward uh, toward their products etc so i think if we created you know more of a civil society movement against the fossil fuel sector, that that might do something uh, more, more quickly. Uh, and just the recognition of how much they've been subsidized and are continuing to be subsidized. I mean, those that data is starting to come out, but I don't think the public has gotten the message as, uh, as much as they, they need to. 
So we need, you know, we need Greta to sort of get out there and get sort of banging on the fossil fuel sector. If we all went, I don't know if you saw the slide about the uh, clean the sky. Let me go back to that if I can find it. Yeah. So <clears throat> look at the right side. You know, we're saying what we need is to is to start going to their their door and saying, yeah, we're going to start charging you. <laughs> Get people to go sit at the door of the fossil fuel companies and say, "Here's the bill." You know, uh, you can either pay the bill in money, or you can, you know, invest in projects that we approve that are going to improve the, the situation or undo the damages that you that you've already done. I don't know. That's one. That's one idea. Yeah. Hi, I have a question about um, measurements of subjective well-being in animals it's very interesting how these various measures has developed uh, applied to human yeah. how do you think we can best measure uh, the subjective well-being uh, of animals and how could that be factored in somehow into how we should design a sustainable economy well i know there's a lot of people with pets and they all they all are sort of keeping track of their pet's well-being quite effectively on a on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm sure there's there's some research about, well, there's there's sort of physical health uh, that's relatively straightforward to measure, I think, and even in domestic animals. Uh, but <clears throat> but mental health and well-being, I guess that's uh, that's another that is an open open question. But I'm sure that somebody here at Oxford could could work on that. <laughs> I'd also wonder whether individual animal health is the way to go, or whether it's community well, community health, but it's as it has people as well, you know, ecological health, ecosystem health. I think world. that's a really critical point too, because when we think about community health, it's usually the individual health aggregated together or averaged out or something. And that's not really that's mm -hmm. not really it. That misses the social capital component. Mm -hmm. So how do we look at the health of the community as a community um, at different scales? Same for animals as well. Um, <clears throat> Thank you for the camera. Oops, <laughs> sorry. Um, what do you think are the, like is the role or limitations to international law specifically for doing or enforcing such mechanisms like this trust, for example? Right. <clears throat> well, there's the public trust doctrine that's, that's mentioned here, uh, which I think could be an effective um, addition to international international law that says that, you know, that governments are responsible for, for protecting the commons. And there have been some court cases, I think in the Netherlands, there was one that was actually successful, you know, where they made this, this point. And they, they concluded, the court concluded, yes, the Dutch government is responsible for protecting the atmosphere. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you could expand that. Um, and in the US, there's an ongoing case called our Children's Trust, where they're trying to make the same point. Uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think it's going to take a, a bit of, of uh, uh, innovation uh, going forward uh, to make the case like how, and we've thought about that. How do you set up an atmospheric trust at the global scale? How many countries need to get on board? Uh, the legal people we've been talking to say that doesn't have to be everybody. You know, it just needs to be a subset uh, of, of countries that can come together and establish this trust and then start charging for damages. So um, it, it could happen. But we need those countries uh, to come together, and maybe the well-being economy governments can can start that. I was um, wondering about your thoughts on the impact of AI, artificial intelligence, on economic growth. I think I've read places <laughs> that this is, you know, predicted to super accelerate growth across the globe and also accelerate inequalities. Yeah. So, what kind of your views on the impact of AI and on yeah. what you've been talking about? Well, I'll have uh, Chat BPT write a response to you. <laughs> no, that's a good question. I have, I, I really don't know. Um, if you think about um, uh, sort of robotization, though, and and production of goods, and you know, having having less human input, human labor input to to production. There's a lot of you know people that are worried about the aging of populations. China's population is, is starting to decrease now for the first time ever, and they're starting to you know you hear all these people getting worried about what are they going to do? What are they going to do? Got to have more people so we have more growth. Blah blah blah. Well, <clears throat> I think there are other ways to to look at that problem. So if we have 
uh, <clears throat> fewer people or the same number of people, and they could be supported by more robotic production and you know universal basic income. Uh, we don't need to tie to tie people's income to their sort of work in factories uh, kind of thing. And so, if we had people, you know, more uh, free uh, to do to do other kinds of things, then I think they could create uh, a higher well-being in the community without necessarily growing, you know, GDP without producing more stuff. They could produce more art, you know, more more community uh, interactions, more things that actually do contribute to to well-being, but are not not so production oriented. So I don't think it has to increase uh, GDP growth um, necessarily. Um, yes. I, have, I have a question. Oh, how do you turn this on? It's it's on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. um, I've been reading about the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act for mm -hmm. Wales that was passed in 2015, mm -hmm. a book written by the um, the lady who really brought it into fruition, Jane Davidson. Mm. Um, and I wonder if it's something that we could focus on a bit more because I, I love the way that it brings well-being in and discussing the well-being of future generations. As soon as you start to see things in that frame, it just changes every thought that you have, really. Mm. Yes, I think that's great. And, and I think that's exactly what we need to do is start thinking about well-being and not just current well-being, but the well-being of the future of the future of the system. And not just us, but the whole the whole system as well. So I think that's the essence of the therapy that I'm proposing. <laughs> okay, you're on board. <laughs> and there are other there are other initiatives like that that have come about. I think people have been talking about this shift, you know, for, for a while now in various pockets. And like Andrew Sims has said, you know, these things have all been tried in, in, in different places. Uh, so we're not, it's not like we have to, you know, um, recreate everything. We just need to put it all together and get our goals straight. Thank you, Bob. I enjoyed this very much. Um, and I like the, the list uh, you showed in the end. And um, it made me think of the first kind of the list, this list that come from an ecological economist almost 50 years ago by Georgescu Rogan, the minimal bioeconomic program. Mm -hmm. And there's quite substantial overlap with, with the list you showed. But um, interestingly, he puts as the very first point of the list, uh, the escalation of war and war instruments. And this is something that seems to have fallen out from most uh, of the lists of these kinds we, we make from ecological economics and when we are in a socio-political context where we see escalating war conflict and nuclear threat mm. um i wonder if there's something we were sort of missing from from the picture or if you have some comment on this um <clears throat> well it was sort of missing from this list because i think it was <clears throat> you know a model of the of the canadian economy it wasn't including everything but i think you're talking about governance issues if i'm not if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, how do we have a more sort of democratic uh, system? And, you know, democracy is a great idea. And I think we ought to try it. Because <laughs> yeah, the systems we have now are not really democratic and they're getting less, less democratic, even though they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're sold as being democratic, uh, but they're not really the, the will of the people uh, in, in any real sense uh, because of the influence of lobbyists and money and, you know, the whole method for, for selecting representatives. So I talk in the book a little bit about, about that and uh, uh, the idea that we need more deliberative democracy, if you've heard that term before, where instead of, you know, electing representatives, you select representatives at random from the population and have citizen assemblies. And that way you're going to get a representative sample of the population and their different views, and they can't be influenced by lobbyists because they're just selected at, at random. Um, and then, you know, how we deliberate also, I think, needs some, uh, some, some innovation. And there's this idea of sociocracy rather than, than uh, democracy. So instead of, instead of uh, you know, looking for consensus or having, you know, 50% rule, you say, well, how do we find the policies and decisions that everyone can, can uh, be okay with, everyone can buy into, everyone can consent to? And if you can't get that, you try to look for well, why can't you consent? You know why do those individuals why are they, why are they not able to consent? And can we change the the, uh, the the policy to the point where they can? So it's much more of a interactive discussion kind of approach 
that's aimed at, you know, getting what most of the people really want rather than, than uh, just what the uh, 51% want or what the actually what the 1% want <laughs> these days. Just to pick up, pick up on that point, you talked a bit about much of your framing is around better democracy. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we live in a world where half, more than half the world's population lives under autocracy and many of the major powers are also democratic powers. And some, interestingly, still making progress like China in the yeah. yeah. civilization. So how uh, do we think in, in this world of various a spectrum of democratic actors? Are we affected across that rather than just saying the Canada's of the New Zealand's of this world? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. No, that's a great question. And, you know, how do, how do we get some form of governance that really is going to help us uh, achieve these goals? Mm -hmm. And I guess you could argue that, you know, autocracy, if at least from a benign point of view, if you had a benign dictator who really, you know, accepted all of these ideas, um, they might be more efficient at, at actually pulling off the kinds of things that we have to do. But I don't think in the end that's going to be the the solution because you know you really need, do need to have um, you know the the population on board, uh, and I think it's really the the well being of the population that you're you're after, not necessarily the well being of the one percent or the the autocrats that are that are involved. And we know that if you go too far with that, eventually there's going to be a revolution and <laughs> they'll get thrown out of power. But how do we make that transition more more smoothly and effectively? I'm open to suggestions. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think one thing that comes out quite clearly is the role of care and solidarity in trying to build this transformative economics. And perhaps one group of actors that have proven quite effective is indigenous communities in managing you know, assets as commons. Um, what role do you see for them in, in building this transformative economics, um, especially also bearing in mind that in many of the spaces where we really need different uh, diversity of inputs to, to work towards this transformative economic, they might not have the space to, to actually even contribute. <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't quite get the, <laughs> the underlying question there. So there's a group of, there are- So social, of... indigenous communities as uh, social actors that have somehow proven effective in, in managing the commons. Are there, are there actors that are- Indigenous, indigenous yes, communities. Yes, yes. Yeah. No, that's well. That's what Eleanor Ostrom studied for you know for her for her work were indigenous communities and how they how they functioned, what they had to do to create these systems that were effective at managing the commons sustainably and well. So um, yeah, I think we can use we can use that sort of approach and look at those communities that where it has worked. Is that what is that what you were getting at? How do we bring them into the mainstream where you know we go? Ah, okay. Well, I think sort of um, bringing that experience to light, you know, and 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 showing uh, the rest of the world how how those systems can function, I think is a is a good first step. Uh, but also, I think from a you know democratic point of view, you want to have them on board with any sort of discussion that you're having about how to build new institutions, uh, so that so that all of those voices can be incorporated. And those experiences can be incorporated. You know, is that what you mean? <laughs> okay. We've been doing that for a while. We like, like you rightly mentioned the Australian show, but I'm just wondering if you know there are new ways to perhaps. Um, other than what I just said, I don't know. Do you have do you have a suggestion? No. <laughs> Thanks for the question, though. It's a good point. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, my question is about how can we sell this to developing countries or emerging economies that are still preoccupied with, quote unquote, catching up in terms of the traditional economic growth model. And especially if we consider like the climate justice aspects of it and the historical emissions of yeah. it, um, how that might be like something developing countries would be reluctant to get on board with. So how do we address that? Thank you. Yeah, <clears throat> that's a good point. And um, thanks for that. I think we need to make the point that um, what developing economies should not be doing is making the same mistakes that the developed economies have made. And I think the first step there is to point out that developed economies have made mistakes. <laughs> this is not something that, that they should be emulating. 
Uh, and so if they want to develop, they should develop in a different way that is focused on well-being rather than focused on, on growth, because we know that that strategy, that development strategy has resulted in you know, the problems that we're having now. So don't repeat the same mistakes. Going to make mistakes, at least make new ones, you know. Yes. <laughs> uh, but at least you know, be a little more creative and say, okay, let's create a, an economy here that that really does support well-being. And now it's going to, in many cases, it's going to require more production, more consumption. But how you distribute that production and consumption is going to have to be quite different than what normally happens. You know, in developing countries, you get a loan from the World Bank, you build a big project, all that money goes to you know the 0.01 percent of the population. And nobody else is any better off. They're worse off, right? <clears throat> and they're mining, you know, you know, with the indigenous miners that that are, uh, and all of that product is going to, you know, somewhere in the in the developed world. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, it's going to take a different approach to what development really means, and how and how those strategies can work. And I think the the onus would be on both the developed and the developing countries to be more creative, you know, about how they do that that in the developed countries, we're probably gonna need less you know, production and consumption. And that's gonna make some space available for you know, production and consumption elsewhere. Uh, but how that gets distributed, uh, what sort of impacts it has on, on um, ecosystems, et cetera, is gonna have to be very different. I think we should probably uh, more things to uh, I just have one final question, uh, which uh, I think uh, uh, here we have in a community of you know, largely students and academics and practitioners, if you were to recommend one thing or a few things that they should prioritize to make their contribution to this transition that you see, then what would, what would be your, uh, your suggestion, your recommendations? Yeah, that, that's often the, the thing at the end of these talks. What should individuals do? And, and I think the problem is um, individuals can't do much individually. I think we have to do things as a group. So how do we build a community? How do we how do we build a shared vision? Uh, how do we you know how do we begin to come more together uh, to, to do these kinds of things? Um, and I think it's going to take more than just electing different politicians as well, uh, because I think they're going to be elected based on representing you know the the kind of shared vision that we can create. So um, how can you come together with all of your your colleagues and and others uh, to say no? We want a different you know we want a different world. I don't know if that helps. <laughs> okay, I think uh, we'll, we'll wrap up here. So just, there are drinks down the corridor so it's time for more informal conversation. You can also buy and, and get a signed copy of Bob's book as well. Thank you very much.